little town of Bethlehem. Today we light the candle of joy. (laughs) 
As we light this candle, we are reminded of the promise God made to bring joy to all of his children by sending a Savior. Psalm 16, 9 through 11 says, Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. The birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, brings peace and assurance into a dark and scary world. He brings the light of God into the darkness, and it is in that light that we find ultimate joy. Grandma, we lead us in prayer. battery. It's dead. <laughs> <Come on up. laughs> I tell you what, very few things match hearing a child's voice being lifted up. I love, I love hearing the kids sing. The, uh, how y'all doing this morning? Woo! Yeah, we got, uh, let's do it again. How y'all doing this morning? There you go. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been searching for something and you just couldn't find it? I mean, you tore the house apart looking for something, and no matter where you look, it wasn't coming into view. And then all of a sudden, you find it, and you go, man, if it had been a snake, it would have bit me. Because it was right there in front of me the entire time. I remember not that long ago, I was frantically searching for my truck keys. I was running late, and I'm tearing the house apart. Couch cushions are flying everywhere. Cups out of the pantry. Everything is going everywhere because I'm looking for my truck keys. And not only can I not find them, now I start thinking everybody in the house is against me. Christy hid them somewhere. Drew hid them somewhere. The dogs put them in their kennels. I don't know where they are, but I cannot find my truck keys. How many of y'all have ever been there? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I stuck my hand in my pocket. And I thought, man... If I had only known. It's funny how it works out that way. 
And I knew it was there because I put them there. So I knew that I had what I was searching for the entire time. I knew what was going to bring me joy, what was going to bring me excitement was there from the first moment. But I was too busy being emotionally wrapped up in the search, looking for something that I thought I was missing, looking for something to fill the void. And the void that I had at that moment was getting out of the house. I needed the truck keys in order to go. Remote starts are awesome, but they don't let the truck move. So you have to have the key. And I'm searching everywhere, trying to find it, and I had it all along. You know, how many times do we do that in our life? We spend our lives searching for something meaningful. We, search our, we spend our lives searching for something that we feel we're missing out on. Something where there's a void inside of our lives. And we search for something that, to believe in, something that's meaningful, something to fill that void. And we get so wrapped up in the search that we overlook a simple fact that we already have what we're searching for. We already have what we're looking for. In our lives, we become so wrapped up in trying to find what we think we need that we don't pay attention to what we actually need. Our lives become so busy. We're running through from schedule to schedule, from moment to moment, trying to pack our days. I used to hear people say all the time, if I just would keep my day busy, I won't get into trouble. If I just keep my day busy, my life will be happy. If I just will keep my day busy, my life will be comfortable because I know what I'm doing from moment to moment. And that may be how you operate. But the question I've got for you is where's their time to stop and smell the roses? If you're busy from sunup to sundown, which some of us have to be, but do you have time built in where you can stop and smell the roses? Do you have time where you can realize that that comfort, that ultimate joy in your life that you are looking for to fill that void, we already have. And we already have it in the birth of our Savior. We already have it because God has sent it to us. He has given us His Son to be here with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He has given us the ultimate source of love, of joy, of comfort that we ever need if we would just stop and realize it. You know, for many of us, this time of year is our absolute favorite time of year. It is mine. I love the music. I love the sights and the sounds, the lights. I love the, the festivities like we had this past weekend. I love getting together. I love going down the road and seeing how different homes are lit up. I love the peace that comes with it. And I love the food. Because let's just face it, food is good this time of year. And I love interacting with that. I love ha having that coming in. But there's something more important than all of that. And that is what happened that special night in Bethlehem. This past week, we had an opportunity to go back home and see some of our family and friends that we haven't seen in months. And we were driving through Georgetown, Texas. And as we're driving through, we entered this parking lot because one of our family decided that they needed to go to the store. I'm looking at Christy. When it was, and, and for me, I always said, hey, this is during the holidays. I'm not going to a store. I'm staying clear away from that because I don't like the huge crowds that that brings because people just run over everybody. People are wedging into parking spaces. It, it's a madhouse in the parking lot. And I started to think as we were driving through this parking lot, why is everybody here? They're rushing into the stores for those Christmas gifts that we all love to get to try to bring happiness and joy into somebody's life. And if we stop and think about it, we realize it's a temporary fix. It's a temporary fix. How many of the Christmas gifts that we've always loved getting have, ended, have still been with us? Or how many have ended up by the wayside? What's the true source 
of comfort, of joy in our lives. Sure, I could go out and I could buy something very expensive and say, here, I love you. Or I could spend time with you. Or I could point you to God. That's the ultimate source. But we get so wrapped up in the secular culture that we overlook what God has done. Because we're always looking for that next biggest and best things. We always have to outdo what we did last year. We always have to go, okay, what are we going to buy our family this year? Because it can't be the same thing, and we can't do some simple task. It's got to be big and better presents. And it gets to a point where it's like, well, what can I buy them that they don't already have? Well, what can I give them that they don't already have? Time. Time. And love. And the message of love and grace in the gospel. That's what people need. That's what our world needs. We say it all the time. Our world needs Jesus. Well, everybody is looking for something during this time of year. They're looking for comfort. They're looking for something meaningful. They're looking for a sense of happiness in their lives. Yesterday morning over at the Big O, I had a conversation with a couple of people that said, you know what, I'm looking for a church to go to at Christmas. Y'all do a Christmas service. And I said, absolutely. I'd love to see you there. And in my mind, I'm thinking, why just Christmas? Come tomorrow. Come the next day. Come all year long. We'd love to see you. Did I say those words? Regrettably, no. I said, yeah, Christmas Eve, we're here. Candlelight service, come on. Christmas morning, we're going to be here. I'd love to see you. And I hope they come. But I was kicking myself. Why didn't I take that extra step? Why? Because I was caught up in the moment and not realizing what was in front of me. It happens to all of us. And sometimes we ask for a sign. Sometimes we say, hey, God, just give me one little sign that this is where I'm supposed to be or this is what you want, the conversation you want me to have or who do you want me to invite. And God says, I've already given you everything you need. This morning as we dive into God's word, we're going to be looking at a familiar passage that we spend a lot of the Christmas season going over. One that is often read during this time, one that a lot of people have memorized, one that is part of our family traditions. And what we're gonna, what my prayer is, is that we can experience the undeniable sense of comfort and joy that is found in this passage. That's found in the fact that God sent us the baby, that he sent us our savior. But in order to get to the point where we can have that undescribable, undeniable, overwhelming joy, we need to look at this passage in a couple of ways. I want to look at it from a historical perspective, and I want to look at it from a prophetic perspective. And those may sound like $10 words, and you go, okay, Pastor, I don't even have a clue what those two words actually mean. Well, it'll come clear as we go through this morning. Look with me over in Isaiah chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 10. It says, Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of God? Now, there's a lot of things that are in this passage in and of itself. And I want to look at it from a historical point of view first. We have the prophet Isaiah, who God is sending to go deliver a message to Ahaz and his people. Over in the land of Judah. Now, Ahaz is king of the time. And he's not the nicest of kings. There's a lot of turmoil going on in his kingdom. He has his faults. Uh, just like anybody else. But one thing that he has is a passion and love for God. And he wants to be connected with God. And he wants his people to be connected with God. And there's word coming to him that his people are drifting away. They're falling away from their relationship with God. They're being wrapped up in some fear that their hearing is coming. And that is that there's an alliance that's being formed between Israel and Aram, and there's going to be a pending invasion coming against his kingdom. And he's kind of freaking out here. 
And the words, it, word is coming that his people are nervous. As a matter of fact, look at verse 2 of that same chapter. It says, the hearts of his, meaning Ahaz's, people trembled like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you are scared about a situation? Maybe you're nervous about words that are going to be said. Maybe you're nervous about words you have to say. Maybe there's a decision that needs to be made and you're not sure how to make it. And so you start to get nervous. You start to get anxious. Your heart starts to pound. You start to feel weak in your knees because you're not looking forward to what's fixing to happen. But you know it has to be. Or maybe you receive news that just kind of shakes you to your core. And you go, how am I going to get through this? How, how am I going to handle what is what I'm facing Maybe it's news about a loved one. Maybe it's news about a sickness. Maybe it's news about a financial situation. Maybe it's a news about a job. Maybe it's news about something that has got you so upset and you find yourself just shaking. Or maybe you get scared and it catches you off guard and you start just kind of like, man, okay, I've got to catch my breath. If you've ever been in any of those situations, then you know what Ahaz is feeling right now. Because he is looking for comfort. There's a pending invasion coming. His people are falling away from God. He's not the best of kings, and he knows it, and so does his people. He's in this turmoil. He's in this spot where he needs something. He needs a reassurance that everything's going to be okay. He needs a comfort that everything is going to be okay. He needs a comfort that God is going to take care of him and his people. And so he asks God, and God sends Isaiah to say, hey, it's going to be okay. And as a matter of fact, ask God for the sign you're, ask, you're looking for. Ask him to show you what you want to show. We'll see. And Ahaz goes, nope, I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to test God. You know, when we reject the person who's telling us to do it, we're rejecting the person who sent the person. God has sent Isaiah to speak into Ahaz's life and to say, I'm here for you and I've got a sign for you. Ask it. Ask the question that you need to ask. And Ahaz says no and rejects the prophet Isaiah and in turn is rejecting God. God's trying to give him comfort, and Ahaz is turning away from it. And he says, you can ask anything. It can be from the depths of Sheol to the highest of heavens. It can be the smallest of things. It can be the largest of things. It does not matter. Ask, and it will be given to you. Ask, and you will receive a great gift. Just speak up. And Ahaz says, no. And then Isaiah does something pretty cool here. He calls him out using his full terminology. His, have you ever gotten in trouble in life and not one, not two, but all three names came flying out? I've had that happen. When my mom did it, you were in trouble. When my dad did it, you better run for the hills because you know you messed up. The first, second, and third names, the big formal names come out. Isaiah says, listen, house of David, Ahaz, you're in trouble, man. Lord has told you, ask for a sign, and you are rejecting it? You're saying, no, I don't want your reassurance. I don't want your comfort. I don't want what you have to give me. I'm looking for these things, but no, God... I don't want it from you. And he says the reason why he's not doing it is he doesn't want to test God. But in turn, what he's doing is he's testing God. Because now God is trying to figure out, okay, how do I get through to this guy? And God's got a plan. If Ahaz will just listen. You know, a lot of times it takes a two by four across the head for us to realize, oh, that's what I should have done. Or it's somebody speaking truth 
into our hearts, into our lives. And while it's not easy for us to hear it, it's not easy for that individual to give it either. Just the fear that we have inside, they also do. Because they know they've got to come and talk to you. They know they've got to share something with you. And it makes them nervous just like it makes us. And Ahaz rejects it. You know, my parents would always say the words, you really don't want to go down that road. Or let me stop you before you make a mistake. Or let me stop you before you say something you're going to regret. Anybody else in those shoes? How often did we listen? How often did we take it in? You know, in our lives today, we're probably not going to have somebody come up to us and say, hey, guess what? I'm a prophet. God sent me to speak into your heart. And you better listen. It's probably not going to happen that way. But God does put people in our lives to speak truth in our hearts. God does pull us together as a family to go out and share the message of the gospel in this world. Like I said before, we say it all the time. This world needs Jesus. This world needs love. This world needs something to bring a meaning and a joy into their lives. That something that this world needs is God. And it is up to us to take that out to him. We don't have Isaiah's walking around today. But we've got people that God has put in our lives to share the message. I was given a golden opportunity and I blew it. Honestly, I blew it. I should have said, I'll see you tomorrow. I should have said, what can I pray for you? But what I said was, yeah, Christmas Eve, come. Now, if they show up, great. If they don't, I don't know who they were. So how can I go back to them and say, hey, remember how I said this? What I should have said was this. If I had the opportunity, I would do it in a heartbeat. But I don't know where they are. I don't know if they live in the area. Maybe they were visiting. I don't know. We have to take the opportunity. Otherwise, what we fail to do is we fail to receive the comfort that God is giving us, and we fail them because God wants to give them the same comfort and the same love. Look at verse verse 14, and we're going to see the sign that God is going to give Ahaz. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. This verse is very common during the Christmas season. A lot of us love this verse. A lot of us look at this and go, man, talk about joy. The fact that God is going to send his son for us. That there is going to be a birth that is going to save us. The Messiah is coming. There's so much joy wrapped in this. But we have to understand the significance behind it. And the fact that this is what Ahaz needed to hear. That there's going to be rescuing. There's going to be comfort. It's not going to happen right this second. But down the road, it's going to. God provides the hope and the comfort that Ahaz and his people needs by promising that one day, there's going to be a miraculous birth. And that birth is going to be of a child. And that child is going to be named Emmanuel. Which when you translate that word Emmanuel, it's God with us. God with us. In other words, think about this. The God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, Alpha and Omega, the the biggest source there is, the most powerful thing there is, the creator of everything, took on flesh and bone to come rescue. To save us. And to provide peace and comfort for us. Why would he do that? Because he loves us. And that simple fact right there. Because he loves us. Should fill us with so much joy and happiness. That it just beams out of every spot of us. We can't contain it. We become so excited. And we want to share it with everybody. 
God loves me so much that He came to rescue me. That He came to give me comfort. The very thing I'm searching my whole life for, I already have in Christ. Why don't I embrace that? Why don't I bring that in? Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 1, says this, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of forced labor is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. Notice there's a word that's emphasized there. Comfort. Comfort. My people. God knows exactly what his children need. Judah was headed for a time of exile in Babylon for many, many years to come. Through which life was going to be hard. It was not going to be comfortable. It was going to be painful, in fact. And God wanted to ensure them that he would be taking care of them. And eventually he was going to pull them out of it. He wanted to provide reassurance. Now, to look at it from, we looked at it for now from a historic view. I want to look at it from a prophetic view. And for that, you got to look at Matthew chapter 1. It says, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah. A son will be born. Jesus. God is sending his son for us. Now, did they realize that back in the days of Isaiah? Some 740 years before Christ? Probably not. I mean, have you ever been in a situation that you go, I know exactly why I'm here. I know exactly what God is doing. I, I can see the pieces put together. In the moment, yeah, no. It takes us looking back and going, okay, because that happened and that took place and over here this happened and this and I didn't even know that this was going on but at the same time in my life it was doing this and together, okay, now I can piece everything together and I can see it. We have the prophecy fulfilled. We look at Matthew and we go, okay, Jesus is the fulfillment. Absolutely. We look back and we can see the pieces. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that because we get so wrapped up in what we think we need, what we think we're missing, what we feel we have to have, and we forget the simpleness of it. Think about all the things that are happening in your life right now. Think about what brings you joy. Think about what brings you peace. Think about what provides comfort for your life. Think about what makes you feel the most loved. If I'm not missing the mark, it's when you feel important. It's when you feel inside that you matter. And for many of us, we have different love languages in which we feel that but it all wraps up to one. God considered you so important that he sent his son for you. He sent his son for me to rescue us, to say, you know what, life is hard right now, but there's hope coming. There's something coming for your life that is going to bring you joy. That you're going to feel so loved. You're going to feel so special. And it's coming from me. I'm fixing to do this. God has a plan for our lives. And sometimes we have to go through uncomfortable situations to see it played out. Sometimes we're going to go through the mud to come out on the other side. Sometimes we're going to go through hurts. We're going to go through pain. We're going to go through struggles. 
But on the other side, we're going to be able to look back and go, man, even though I went through all of that, look at where I am. And there's something important that we got to remember, and that is the greatest work that God is going to do through you will oftentimes come when you are the most uncomfortable. The greatest work that God is going to do through us is when we are oftentimes the most uncomfortable. We have to get out of our comfort zones. We have to realize that what God is doing is more important than anything that we personally desire. And yes, it's going to make us uncomfortable. And some of us go, well, I can't do that. I can't be in an uncomfortable situation. I can't be where I don't have control of what's happening. I I can't be where I'm hot or I'm cold or I sleep in an uncomfortable place. I just, I can't do that. I can't function that way. You know, that's a fleshy desire. Because you want to talk about uncomfortable? Think about the birth. Take out the fact of the physical side of a birth. And if if you've ever been pregnant or you've been around somebody who's pregnant, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's uncomfortable. It hurts. It's agonizing. But there's also joy and love and happiness wrapped up in that because of what's coming. You want to talk about uncomfortable? Where was Jesus laid when he was born? In a feeding trough in a stable because there was no room. He was laid in a feeding trough with animals surrounding him. You want to talk about uncomfortable? You want to talk about being pushed outside of your limits? Think about Mary. Think about what she went through because this was not a normal pregnancy. She knew the truth about what was happening to her, and she knew the truth about the child that she was carrying. Because the angel who came and told her. She had to deal with misunderstanding. She had to deal with gossip. She had to deal with rejection. She had to deal with hurt. She had to deal with a tough, rough travel on the back of a donkey. And be told, sorry, you got no comfortable bed here. And what does she do? She says, you know what? All of this doesn't matter. Because the ultimate joy is coming because God has sent him. The ultimate joy is fixing to happen. The ultimate love is fixing to be shared in this world. And I get to be a part of this. That's what she was focused on. And everybody around her saw it. God is bringing the greatest comfort to the world and he's doing it in an experience that is not so comfortable. Now let's be honest for just a second. In our lives, we want God's comfort. But we also want our life to be comfortable. We want both. As my dad used to say, you want your cake and eat it too. You want everything to be exactly how you want it. Well, guess what? It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't. But we take all of our energy, all of our money, all of our financial resources, all of our time to chase the comfortable life. Because we've been told that's going to bring us the ultimate joy. We've been told that that is going to bring us the happiness that we long for. That's going to fill the void in our life when it's not these things are temporary what's ultimate is the love of God that came in the birth of a baby in a special night in a town called Bethlehem it's the only thing that matters it's the only thing that matters we say well if if I want to have a great life I've got to be healthy and i got to be wealthy, and i got to be comfortable. Really? Tell that to Jesus. Because he came as a lowly baby. 
He came as a servant. He was laid in a feeding trough. In all my studies, I've never seen in Scripture, when we follow Jesus, everything's going to be rosy. We're always going to be healthy. We're always going to be wealthy. We're always going to be comfy. Think forward to the cross. Tell that to Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. Is he healthy? No. Is he wealthy? No. They're dividing his garments. Is he comfy? No. He's got the weight of the sin, the sin of the world on him and he's pierced and he's bleeding. He's nailed to a cross. Is it comfortable? No. But it was necessary to be uncomfortable so God can bring the comfort. So God can rescue us. And in order for the cross to take place, the birth had to happen. And that's what we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. I said it a couple of weeks ago. As we celebrate the birth of our Savior, we're celebrating the day that he was born to die. So that one day, you and I can pray to him to save us, to save our lives. What brings the ultimate joy in our life? It's God. And how, how do we know that God loves us? Because he sent his son to be born to rescue us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so grateful for what you have given us. So grateful in the love that you have showed down, showered down upon us. God, as we continue through this, this season, God, we just pray that amongst all the lights and excitement and festivities and food and everything that we look forward to. God, help us to see that underneath it all, there's one true reason why we celebrate. And it is because of the birth of our Savior that night in Bethlehem. God, we just pray that you continue to work in our lives. We pray that you continue to give us opportunities to be able to share that message with your children out in this world. God, this world is hurting. This world needs your love and your grace. This, girl, this world needs to be reminded of the gift that came through Mary, that came to the world, that was laid in a feeding trough. God, help us to remember that. Help us to tell that narrative to anybody and everybody we come in contact with. God, if there's anybody in here this morning that has been searching for something meaningful in their lives and they have realized that it's you that they're searching for, God, I pray that they don't wait another moment, they don't hesitate for another second, but they say, God, I need you in my life. God, I, I, I'm searching and searching and searching for something to bring me happiness. And I know that it is only you that can provide that. I know that now. But God, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm hurting. And I need you in my life. I need you to come and rescue me. I need you to come and save me. I need you. I need the gift inside of me, God. God, if there's anybody in here that is in that moment, I just pray that they don't wait another second, but they accept you into their life. God, if there's anybody here that says, you know, I'm searching for a family, I'm searching for a church home, I'm searching for somewhere where I belong, I'm searching for a group that I can be a part of, that I can share love and grace with, that I can, I can interact with, that I can praise your name with, that I can be held accountable with, God, if there's anybody in here that's looking for a church home, a church family, God, I just pray that they don't wait another second. They say, you know what, this is it. Because I feel that, God, you're here, and you've got big plans, and I want to be a part of that. I pray they don't wait another moment. 
God, we just love you so much and we're so thankful for all that you do. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. As we go into our final song, the altar is open. Please come and kneel. Spend this time praying to God. You can pray where you're at or you can come up to the altar. I'll be down here in front. If you need prayer, if you want to join this wonderful, loving church family, we'd love to have you. Whatever's on your heart, this is your time. Amen. Well, today is such a fantastic day because not only is God on the move, and he definitely is here in Thompsonville, not only is he on the move, but he is adding to our family. We've got some families that have said, you know what, this is my church home, and I want to be a part of this family, and I want to be a part of what God is doing here. And so we have Lana and we have the Davis family that have decided, you know what, this is where I belong. If you will welcome them into our church family, please do so. Oh, what a joyous day this is. I'm going to ask Brother G. David if you will close in a word of prayer, and then I'm going to ask these families to stand out here with me. Y'all, make sure you stop by and say, welcome to the family, and uh, let's show them, show them God's love, and then take that out into the world. Brother G.